This morning, we're going to hear from one of our very own minister, Ken Ponce. So at this time, do receive him with a hearty amen. amen. Thanks so much. I just want to pray for a second. Lord, please help us to take every advantage of this time together today so that we don't waste a single moment of it. We know we're here for you. We're here to serve you as best we can through the service of each other. And bless everything that we do for the remainder of the service. In your son's name, amen. What I want to talk to you about today um, is our true home, where we belong, what it will be like, and God's promise of that home. There's an old song called Home on the Range. It's a state song of Kansas. And by the way, that's the Kansas state flower, uh, the wild sunflower. If you indulge me for a second, I want to sing this and feel free to join in. Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam, where the deer and the antelope play, where seldom is heard a discouraging word. And the skies are not cloudy all day. Home, home on the range, where the deer and the antelope play, where seldom is heard a discouraging word, and the skies are not cloudy all day. What comes to mind when you hear that, and when you, especially when you sing it? I, I wanted you to get the feel of that. It feels like home, doesn't it? It's that, that longing, that desire for home. It sounds like a place of peace, a place of encouragement, which right there is enough for me. Calm, pleasant weather, especially after last winter. A place where someone can really relax and be themselves, a place where they can appreciate just being alive. The cowboys sung about it, they wrote songs about it, they wrote poems about it. They longed for that open range, that place where they could really feel at home, even when they had a reason to maybe temporarily have to go into the city, maybe it was a cattle sale or something like that. They would do their thing, but they couldn't wait to get back on the range because they felt that that's where they belonged. That's where they wanted to be. The Lord gave Adam and Eve a special place. You've heard this story before in Genesis 2. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man who he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. This was a garden full of the beautiful things God had made. Soon afterward, Adam was joined by Eve. So they had their home on the range. They had their place where they belonged, where they could be calm and happy and live in peace, a verdant place by a river. I live by a river. The missus and I live uh, right on the Taunton River in Berkeley. One of our favorite things is, particularly on a Sunday afternoon, is to just get out there and sit and just listen to the birds watch the river go by, maybe a boat will come floating by. Maybe one of those annoying jet skis will, will come by, you know. Um, but it's just great to be out there, and this is where you can kind of let everything go, and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm home. This is where I want to be. This is where I want to be at the end of a tough week. I just want to go home and chill out. When things aren't going well, when you're having a problem, don't you just say, man, I just wish I could go home. You want to go home. So if we enjoy that that much, what must it have been like for Adam and Eve? I mean, 
th it had to be an awesome place. I mean, we, we don't really know exactly what it was like, but we kind of get the idea. However, it didn't last because they made a little mistake. We're familiar with that story. They were told not to eat from a certain tree, but they did anyway, right? That little snack was the most expensive meal in the history of mankind. It cost them everything. They lost their home on the range. What they did had effects that we feel to this day. So we know it was an act of mercy because had they eaten from the tree of life as well, hey, you've made one mistake, sometimes it's a short step to your next mistake, then they would have been stuck forever in their sin and there would have been no hope for them or for us. So he drove out the man and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Their home on the range was gone. There was another example of a very special home. Genesis 15, 18 through 21. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kedmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Another verdant land of plenty of a different sort, another gift from God. Something they were all very much looking forward to. Later on, Moses was looking forward to leading them into that very same promised land. Along the way, something happened. Moses received a specific direction from God. In Numbers 20, we see, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, take the staff, assemble the congregation. You and Aaron, your brother, tell the rock, remember this part, before your eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. Seems simple enough. Tell the rock you want to yield some water, we'll hook, I'll hook you up. However, he didn't quite follow God's direction. He took his staff, as we know, and he gave the rock a couple of good cracks. So now the Lord's saying, is that what I told you to do? No, not exactly. I just said, speak to the rock. You'll be fine. So God didn't deprive the people of the water, but Moses is now on the hook for his disobedience. He missed out because he let his temper get the best of him. He did it his own way. That may work for Frank Sinatra, but it didn't work here. So because of his disobedience, his lack of trust in God, this cost him plenty. Again in Numbers 2012, and the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. Uh-oh. There goes the home on the range for Moses. He's missed an important opportunity to lead them in to serve the Lord. It's my favorite expression. To serve the Lord through the service of others. He blew that by being disobedient, by not trusting God, not doing it the way the Lord told him to do it. He did get to see what he'd miss. Deuteronomy 34, 1 through 4 says, Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, 
the land of Ephraim and Manasseh. All the land of Judah as far as the Western Sea. This was an expansive piece of property, beautiful area. The Negev and the plain, that is, the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees as far as Zoar. And the Lord said to him, this is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to your offspring. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. Imagine how Moses must have felt after all this time, all this effort, right at the age, just where you are, you're almost where you want to be. You're almost to the promised land. You go, oh, you won't be going. Yikes. So where am I going with all this? What about us? The picture I've painted for you so far is not terribly optimistic. We know we're disobedient. We know we don't do what we're supposed to do a good part of the time. What about our home on the range? How's that going to turn out? Well, our situation's a little different. And yes, there is a, a promised land for us, a real home, a heavenly home for us. For those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have a citizenship that's not here, it's in heaven. There's a reason why as Christians, as we go through the Christian life, it's not always a comfortable thing, right? We, we meet a lot of opposition. Not always the easiest thing in the world. It seems like you're a little group with a ton of people that disagree with you all around you every day. Uh, one of the reasons I think it's so important for us to touch base with each other frequently because there's so much around us that, that want to drain away from us. We, we need to stay refreshed and we need to stay with each other. So, so a time like this is so important. So this citizenship in heaven, we, we know it's, we're not, we're not, we thought we were comfortable here, right? We thought this was, this was it until we got saved and then we said, wow, this is not it. This, isn't, this doesn't feel right anymore. Right? There's, there's another place where I really belong, and this ain't it. But this is where we have to be for now. Um, because this is where we've got to work out what the Lord has for us. This is where we work to build the kingdom. But we know that we're looking ahead, right? As believers, we don't feel death. Nobody wants to phys physically die. Nobody's looking forward to that. We're not into pain, that kind of thing. right? But, but death itself, we don't fear that anymore because we know that there's a place where we belong and we know it'll be there for us. Philippians 3.20 says, Our citizenship is in heaven. That kind of makes it official. It's not like, oh, gee, be a nice place. We'd like to go there. No, it's, it's official. We belong there, and that's where we're going to be. So let's talk about that a little bit. Something uh, a little descriptive here. Revelation 22, 1 through 5. It says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, brightest crystal flowing from the throne of God. All right, sign me up. I'm already, that's good enough for me. I'm already ready to, you know and of the lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also, try to picture this as I go, if you can. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life. Remember, Adam and Eve, tree of life. With its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. This is going to be, we use that expression, one big happy family. This is it, baby. They will see his face. Right, you basically go see the face of God. Wow. And his name will be on their foreheads. You all belong to me. That citizenship, we belong to the Lord. Night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Forever, in the presence of the Lord, with no evil, with no difficulty, with no suffering, 
and it'll never end. That's what I'm talking about. Now that's home on the range. That's where I want to be. That's something to get excited about. Amen to that. Not only that. You know, and we, we, and we, try, to, we try to represent this physically, and, something, and, and artists still do, do what they can, but, but we, we really can't picture it. I mean, even we can try to imagine what it, what it might be like. All we know is it's going to be awesome, and I'm not worried about the details. <laughs> I just want to be there. Gets better as we go. Let's back up to Revelation 21, 3 and 4. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. It's over. You're okay now, and you're going to be okay forever. Oh, what a thing to hold on to. What a hope. I want to read you something from Matthew Henry, because there's a a part here that sometimes people maybe skip over a little too quickly. The part about wiping away every tear. There have been often... They have been speaking of of the redeemed. They have been often before in tears by reason of sin, of affliction, of the calamities of the church. But now all tears shall be wiped away. No signs, no remembrance of former sorrows shall remain any further than to make their present felicity the greater. God himself, as their tender father, with his own hand, shall wipe away the tears of his children. There's, uh, David Jeremiah once spoke about the, this part, and he, and he said, you know, people say, well, there's no crying in heaven, there's no tear in heaven. He said, well, at first, there's, you know, that might be that bit of, um, that bit of sadness, and as you come in, maybe that bit of regret, or that, you know, that what you've suffered through before, he talked about how that's when God will take that away. And then there really will be no more crying and having except maybe tears of joy. Anyway, it's important to remember. Here's the part I want to hold on to after all that talk about losing your home on the range. Our weakness can sometimes result in disobedience. Our lack of trust in God's promises can make our lives harder make us miss out on opportunities to be used by God. But we have his promise of life to come. For those who believe, for those of us who've truly handed ourselves over to the Lord Jesus Christ, it's the ultimate promised land, and we will not miss out on it. We will be there forever. Can I get an amen to that? All right. A couple of things to remember. John 5, 24 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Notice the the way this is expressed. This is a done deal. This is not maybe or possibly or if you work hard enough. If you are part of the family of God, this is a done deal. This is an ironclad guarantee and you can take it to the bank. Jesus also says in John 14, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Jesus is saying, don't worry. I'm going to have a special place ready for you. I've done all the work. You just need to trust me. Awesome. And there's just one more little thing. The best part of all. Are you ready? Wait for it. Heaven is where Jesus is. I don't know about you, but I want to be with Jesus. Church, say it with me. I want to be with Jesus. Amen. Oh my goodness, what could be better than that? That's where I want to be. 
I'll do whatever I have to do to build the kingdom while I'm here, but I'll tell you, I can't wait. I want to be with Jesus. Heaven is where Jesus is. That's where we all want to be, all day, every day with the Lord Jesus. One day for us, the song is going to go like this. Home, home on the range with the angels and the family of God where never is heard a discouraging word and we live in his presence all day. Hallelujah. Thank you, church. God bless you. Isn't that delicious? Amen. You know, I was thinking as he was preaching, there's a homelessness crisis in this country. And we see it on the news. We see it in the cities. And it doesn't just happen in the big cities. There are people that don't have homes. And anyone who has a heart has to be moved and we try to imagine what that might be not to have a home. It, it makes you wonder, the prodigal son had a home and he left his home. For those thousands, millions of Americans that are living in the streets because they just don't have it. Do you know there's a spiritual homelessness in this world? There is a state, a place that God put us that we fell from. And as I'm thinking about this, I realize, you know, I don't have to wait till I die and go to heaven to know what it's like to live with God. Because he says, my body is his temple. And God is anxious and wants to live with us today. So when I wake up in the morning, I can feel his presence. When I lay down at night, I can know that he'll never leave me nor forsake me. I guess I better stop now. <laughs> Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we do thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, because you've given us a home. God, our home is in you. And you've invited us to abide in you. And you want to abide in us. Lord, we thank you, Lord. Be with us as we go forth. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before his throne with exceeding joy to the only wise God, be glory, power, and dominion, both now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you.